everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to ChasingCinema.com's official YouTube channel. I am your host, Jacob Toronto, and today I'm going to be doing a non-spoiler review of Suicide Squad. So if you do watch the YouTube channel here at ChasingCinema.com, you're probably wondering, well, where's James Shu, Jake? Why are you not at AMC Town Square? Well, I was able to see the Suicide Squad quite in advance, and like I did with X-Men, I want to give you guys a non-spoiler review and a much condensed review as well. Usually Mr. James Shu go in full detail, have a 30, 45 minute conversation, and that might not be everyone's cup of tea. And usually it's filled with spoilers. So what I'm going to do right now is review Suicide Squad, revealing little to no spoilers. Only things that were revealed in the trailer. Uh, and let you guys know how I feel. So obviously you could tell there is some excitement by seeing David Ayer's Suicide Squad. A movie that I really feel can change the way that the DC universe is heading right now. At least the live action on the live action front. Um, after the Batman BVS fiasco, which was a movie I did not particularly care for, I thought was below mediocre, I was really hoping Suicide Squad is the one to change the round. And I must say, after leaving the theater, I was disappointed. Suicide Squad has everything it could possibly have in order to be a successful superhero action summer blockbuster, but it just somehow fails to grasp it. Now, I will say right off the bat, Suicide Squad is better than BVS, but it is still not a great movie. Suicide Squad is filled with fascinating characters and solid action, but yet it still manages to drag. This movie stands at only about two hours and five minutes and it manages to feel too long and scenes feel like they take forever. It's really disappointing when you kind of have this movie that's boom, 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 right off the start. But then, as the movie continues, you can see it slowly starts to climb. I will say Suicide Squad starts off great. I mean, you have characters appearing on screen with their names, their attributes, their specialties, uh, all these members of Task Force X, and you're learning about them. And it's great for people who don't know these characters from the comics. And to be honest, most people only know the few main names, Deadshot, Harley Quinn, um, you know, maybe Killer Croc. But some of those characters aren't very well known. Though a lot of people now, when they're going to see a superhero movie, do some research. And, but the introduction is quite exciting. But then that scene turns into another scene of another introduction of these characters. So already we kind of have that hiccup. And... There are smaller hiccups along the way, but that stylish, kind of exciting feeling eventually disappears. Now, I think my focus needs to be on the characters. Suicide Squad, the members of Task Force X, work really well. I was genuinely surprised. Uh, one character that I thought would not have any effect on me was El Diablo. And I believe he actually became one of the most interesting characters in the entire movie. This His character has an arc. His character is going through changes. His character is constantly trying to stand for something. Where most of the, some of the other characters in the squad are just a glimpse of who they are. Just the surface. Uh, I would like to say, even though I think that Killer Croc is a tough character to take on, the character of Killer Croc doesn't do much, you know? He says a few things, but... Nothing to really get you to understand Killer Croc, but you really kind of get an interesting little view of how El Diablo feels and how his mind works. And he's really an interesting character, and I think one of the most interesting characters in the squad. I would say that Will Smith was the one person that really made me nervous, and probably a lot of you are going, why, Jake, it's Will Smith? Well, he's just the one that felt the most charismatic of this group, the one that felt... You know, not saying Margot Robbie isn't charismatic, but uh, he just seemed too cheeky to be in this really grim kind of story in this grim group. However, he also was a fascinating addition to this group. I mean, really the heart of this movie. I, I really believe that him and uh, the constant references to his young daughter um, and his relationship with his daughter, every action that that character takes 
his daughter is in mind. And we're able to see that and feel that. Sometimes it's visualized. Sometimes it's not even mentioned. But you know that that is something that's constantly playing with the character. And knowing that about him lets us see him more than just the guy who never misses. There's so much more to that character. And Will Smith is really able to balance this great action character who at times is just so badass in slow motion, just taking people out. And then heartbroken and shattered at the look of his disappointed daughter. I mean, it is amazing. I mean, it's really, really gives this movie the heart that it needed because nowhere else can you find heart in this movie. Maybe a little bit with El Diablo, but the, the beating heart of this movie is definitely Will Smith uh, as Deadshot. Now, of course, I know, guys, I know all of you guys are saying, but what about Harley? What about Harley? Now, Harley Quinn, I think, is, is really tough. Not only is she a really interesting, intriguing character that is so complex and beloved by thousands, millions of fans around the world, Margot Robbie has to take on that character for the first ever live action adaptation, and that is not easy. And I honestly think Margot Robbie did a good job. I will say, though, she did not blow me away. This wasn't the performance of a lifetime by any means, you know. Heath Ledger taking on the Joker. People have called that the, the performance of a lifetime for him. Uh, and I don't feel that way about Margot Robbie. I think Margot Robbie did good with what she had. I think what was the problem here, and, and what leads to a lot of other problems later in the movie, is that the script only gives us grasps of things. However, some of these grasps have more feelings than others. Now, Harley Quinn needs her own movie. Harley Quinn needs two hours of your time to fully kind of grasp who she is. And in this movie, we get the gum popping, pudding saying, Mr. J loving Harley Quinn. And it's great and it's wonderful to see her adapted. We have a lot of interesting throwbacks to the, the, the uh, character that we know from the comics. Little, can little things here and there. Um, and I think she does a great job. She's always kind of throwing that wit out and that, that quick, she has that silver tongue. But even though we do get some backstory for Harley Quinn, it really doesn't capture how, of, how much of a fascinating character she is. And hopefully we'll explore that more in another movie. But again, I didn't watch her and say, my God, she's stealing the show. I was watching her and saying, wow, she's good. But where is Deadshot? <laughs> I want to see more of Deadshot. And again, I know this is probably going to not be what people want to hear, but it's true. She does a good job. But the way that this movie is structured, the way that this story is structured, I have more to invest in in Deadshot than I do Harley Quinn. Now let's leave the squad. Yes, I know there are other members of the squad, but to be honest, I mean, I think Jai Courtney did good. I mean... I don't want to go through every single one because me and she will probably do that next week. But those are the ones I feel the most need to talk about. But if you want to know what I feel about every single member of Task Force X, make sure to tune in our review this Friday. Now moving away from the squad, let's get into another person that you guys are probably screaming at the screen of your computers or your phones, whatever you're watching this on, uh, asking about. Jared Leto is the Joker. The Joker also is a very, very hard character. Luckily... The few adaptations we've had have worked great. And I don't think Jared Leto does a bad job. I just don't think Jared Leto does a phenomenal job. I wouldn't say that's on the fault of Jared Leto. I just feel like we've not explored the Joker more than just being the laughing crazy guy. I will say I do think Jared Leto's voice is a little bit Heath Ledger joke, Joker-ish. Right? He does a lot of that heavy breathing. Uh, he doesn't have, I don't think it's, it goes as high as Heath Ledger's did, but it just has that overall feeling. And I, and I wasn't particularly crazy about it, but, but that's okay. I think his laugh is phenomenal. I think he has one of the best Joker laughs ever. Uh, the one we see in the trailer as the logo is spinning, I think it's great, but we just kind of see him as the, he's the crazy guy who looks like a clown. You know, there's no real uh, depthful story in him. And again, I'm sure we're going to explore that character more. But from what I've seen, I was like, okay, I'm okay with it. You know, I'm not 
upset the way he looks. A lot of people complained about the way he looks with his teeth and the tattoos or... Uh, but that didn't, that didn't particularly bother me. I did appreciate the fact that he changed outfits that were inspired by many famous outfits, either in comics or, or different adaptations, but overall the character I didn't have much feeling for. I thought he was okay, and I think he could be great, but we need to explore that character in a much more uh, deeper sense. Uh, the Joker is nowhere near as much in this film as everyone else, um, but... From what I've seen, I think there's potential, but this definitely isn't his movie. Now, I might shock some of you, but someone who I think was way more uh, attractive as a character than Joker in this movie was Amanda Waller. Now, I'm sure a lot of you fanboys and, and people watching are like, oh God, this guy, that, that, what, he doesn't know what he's talking about, but no. Let me tell you, Amanda Waller is one of the most underrated characters out of the comics. And she, Viola Davis brings her to life and sets her on fire. She brings this character with such a fearless, spiteful uh, chutzpah, as they'd say. This, just such gull. I mean, she, she, the way that Amanda Waller, this woman, can just walk up to these characters these you know a man who can create fire harley quinn the killer croc and look them in the eye and threaten them and not flinch is such an um, uh, a fascinating attribute of her character she is just so fearless and uh, ruthless she does there's this one part of the movie that i think is kind of glossed over it really doesn't settle in and what she does but you're just like man this girl is insanely ruthless of course will smith comes in and you know mentions and, and we're the bad guys and really kind of gives us this idea of you know who technically is the bad guy but i mean amanda waller blew me away in this movie i loved every inch of her on this movie Even in the beginning as she ex is explaining what her idea is and the way she manipulates other people she is just awesome and i i i i <laughs> I loved her in this movie. Now, something else that I usually don't talk about unless it's really, really apparent is the soundtrack. Suicide Squad has a soundtrack of just hit after hit after hit after hit. Popular songs that you know when you're listening to the radio. You know, BBS didn't have it. And of course, I don't think it would have worked in BBS. But in Suicide Squad, it works perfect. We have some really, really great songs in here. You know, a lot from the trailers. Pretty much, if you heard it in the trailer, it's made its way into the movie. And it works, and it kind of keeps this movie going. But it only keeps it going for so long because as we kind of get to that third act, as we leave the second and enter the third, the movie kind of loses its pacing and starts getting real draggy. And the reason for that, I think, is because the story of this movie does not work. The story, the film's villain, and where the movie gives us our antagonist. Amanda Waller sets up Task Force X. That is cool. We're all on board. That's, you know, where a lot of these stories begin. However, it's where we end up. That's really, really disappointing. It has to do with an enchant an, uh, Enchantress. I won't get into it. I don't know why I can't say her name right. En Enchantress. Enchantress. <laughs> I can't do it. Uh, it has to do with her. And we'll get into it with Mr. James Chu on our review on Friday. But just know it has a lot to do with her, and it really gets disappointing. I did not care for this at all. I mean, the okay, so there are visuals in the movie that are t a test to her, who, who's this witch, right? So now what I mean by that is the threat in this movie does not feel like a threat at all. It feels like it's not going to be an issue. It, we're just constantly avoiding getting there. Um, we have a big blue beam of light. If you've never heard me talk about that before or any other uh, film critic or person who follows film, you'll know that it's a become a very, very annoying movie cliche and trope that we see in countless superhero movies or movies that have to do with the end of the earth. There's a big blue beam and it's sucking everything up. We Fantastic Four. Uh, I want to say in one of the X-Men's, like maybe it was Days of Future Past, maybe it was Apocalypse, but there's always that thing and it's sucking everything up. It, and we've just seen it a hundred times, and of course it has to be in this movie. Uh, I also don't like where the, the visual effects go in the actual final sequence. 
it just doesn't feel like there's much at stake. It doesn't feel like we're any in any real danger or there needs to be something that happens immediately or, or horrible things were happen. I mean, and, and I don't want to, like I said, I'm trying my best to, to, to talk about this without spoiling it, but there's another character besides Enchantress who just looks completely foolish and it just does not look realistic. It does not look intriguing. And then another character ends up becoming somewhat like kind of looks like him when you see the movie you'll know what i'm talking about and they have this big fight and these like these uh cgi characters have this huge fight and you're just like oh my what and it just doesn't have any um it, it just takes you out of the movie and it takes you out of the characters and it's really really disappointing and the entire plan of the villain and what what the whole story idea is in the plot is not thought out it's just there to give the Suicide Squad something to do, to give Task Force X something to do. And you could tell, and it really, really hurts this movie. And I would say it's really noticeable during the middle of the second act, as we go into the third act, it just kind of really loses that intensity that it starts with. I will say there were small things that I liked and small things that I didn't. There were some character choices in the movie that I didn't necessarily find would match with what I think that character would do. They were making some decisions just based on plot. Some characters reacted a certain way to certain things and I was just like, I don't know if that's really how I imagine this character reacting to it. But there is one really, really great moment. And it actually happens at a bar that you actually get see in the trailer where these, these characters finally, after probably an hour and 40 minutes, get to sit down and they get to talk and you get to hear them talk about their philosophies and talk about being the bad guys and watching them discuss their their ideologies and their philosophies on, on who they are and what they do is probably one of the best parts of the entire film i mean it is so good and then you're really learning about these characters and one of the reasons why i really liked el diablo is because of this scene but it really kind of gives you an insight on who which character is like what who they are as, as characters and I really enjoyed that. But instead of giving us more of that, they want a lot more action. And in, though that works most of the time, that whole third act just feels like a complete waste. And that's where Suicide Squad goes from being pretty good to just good. Like I said, Suicide Squad is better than Batman vs Superman. So all in all, it's an improvement for the DC live action universe. Uh, we even get some Batman that's in the trailers. Uh, ben Affleck appears, not for a very long time, but that's quite cool to see that. Uh, and you get some other, you get actually quite a lot of surprises in this movie. There's a mid-credit scene, uh, no post-post-credit, but a mid-credit scene, so make sure to stick around for that. Um, but I'm going to get more in-depth with my review on Friday, so make sure to tune into that. But quick breakdown, Suicide Squad, an improvement on BVS, but not by much. A movie that offers some really interesting characters, but not a great story. That's going to be what I have to say about this movie. I'm sure I'm going to get some angry people in the comment sections. Please feel free. I want to hear your opinion. I'd love to discuss my thoughts in a deeper um, way. So please write down the comment sections below. I'll be glad to get back to you and let you know how I feel. If you enjoyed this review, make sure to slap a like on it. And if you never want to miss any of our reviews here at Chasing Cinema, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Suicide Squad. It was good. It's the only way I could put it. Okay, but that's going to wrap it up. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jacob Toronto, and please continue chasing Sarah.